Pentecost, as if I haven't mentioned it enough already this morning, it's really about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That's what Pentecost is all about. It's, it's the recognition that something happened long ago, and the belief that God is still moving and still active today. It's a one-time event, but it's repeated over and over again in a million different ways all over the world, all the time. It, it can't be deconstructed. We can't take it apart to understand it. It, it can't really be contained or replicated or understood. It, it transcends all that we are and all that we can understand. We listen to the news. Many people really follow closely what's happening in the world. And there's trouble with this or that. There was trouble with a government agency this past week in the news. And, and with those types of things, we can, we can analyze it and, and sort of speculate on what happened and why and what's going on. Now, there may be some folks who missed some of the, 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 the more uh, serious news because they were so caught up in, in hockey this week. The, NHL playoffs, the Stanley Cup is going on. This is sort of my annual sports reference. I'm, I'm not the biggest follower of sports, in case you didn't know. And so I, I have to do a lot of research whenever I make a sports reference in order to make sure that I get it right or say something that, that makes sense. I, I know there's an old joke in preaching classes that every Sunday, in every verse, it's not fourth down, uh, fourth and goal, and uh, you know your, your backs to the wall or whatever it is. And, and I know that there are many preachers who seem to draw from uh, Sunday afternoon football quite a bit. And so I think initially some people are happy that I don't, but then later they wonder, why doesn't he ever talk about sports? He's American, isn't he? And like an idiot, I'm using a hockey reference. <laughs> <Can I? laughs> well, fortunately, these are two American teams that I was going to talk about. Yesterday, the Detroit Red Wings beat the Chicago Blackhawks. I, I can also make a reference whenever it's a Detroit team, because I'm originally from Detroit. But the Red Wings beat the Blackhawks 4-1. to one. And again, just as with news, the game can be studied and analyzed, and we can try to make sense of why it happened, or, or why the Blackhawks weren't able to win. Many things in life can make sense, can make complete sense. For instance, an old incandescent light bulb stops working. You know you have to replace it. And you can actually explain why it stopped working. It needs the vacuum and the filament and electricity and the vacuum seal and the bulb gets broken. It makes perfect sense that it's not working anymore and you have to get a new bulb. A nail in your tire of your, of your car you know, it's perfectly logical. Get the nail removed, get the tire plugged, or if it's bad enough, you have to get a new tire. There are things like that in the world that just make sense. But then there are many things that don't make any sense. For example, how did the Red Wings beat the Blackhawks? The Blackhawks had a better regular season record than the Red Wings. They were playing in Chicago, so the Blackhawks were at home. And the Blackhawks had just won their previous game. You would think that all of these factors coming together would make it pretty predictable that the Blackhawks would win. But they didn't. There are things that seem like they should make sense, and then we turn them around and suddenly they don't make as much sense. Life is complicated, and then we add to the complicated reality that is our world God's movement, this, this Holy Spirit event. And we have less clue about the Holy Spirit. We have less factual information about the Holy Spirit and God than we do about predicting the outcome of sporting events. We live in this linear world since the Enlightenment. People, all of us, have sought reason. We want to make sense of things. We want an explanation for everything we can get from point A to point B, from question to answer. The apple falls from the tree because of gravity. Newton pointed this out. But as we get further into the 21st century, we find that the answers aren't always quite so straightforward. They're not always what we thought they would be. Life gets more complicated. 
As a matter of fact, there are things that cannot be explained as we get into particle physics and, and different 21st century innovations. We, we, we cannot explain some things. The Swiss theologian Karl Barth built his theology, his entire corpus on God's transcendence and our inability to know God other than through revelation. In other words, we only know God through God revealing God's very self to us. That's the only way we know God. And we might ask, what is this revelation? And we jump instantly to the Bible. But the Bible isn't the revelation. The Bible is the record of God's revelation. This is an important distinction. This isn't the revelation itself. This is the record of the revelation. The reason? Because we don't worship the Bible. We worship God. For a child of the Enlightenment, it can be hard to understand and accept Pentecost. We get to this, this point each year when we use the symbol of red for fire and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We hear this too, repeated year after year, and we try to understand what does it mean in John 14, Jesus leaving this advocate or helper. Do we, do we really believe that there were tongues of fire, little flames that danced? as in the, the bulletin artwork. This has been such, Pentecost has been such a, a wonderful inspiration. And we, we have on the cover of our bulletin this, this morning, these little flames of fire coming down from, from heaven, from Mildorfer's painting called Pentecost. And do we, do we when we, we study it, we analyze it, really picture flames of fire coming down and dancing on each person's head. And if we recognize this, this as a record of God's revelation, and we believe it is, we accept there must be something there. If we accept that we cannot truly know God, fully know God, there must be something more. We want to be Easter people who reflect that we believe Christ is risen. And Pentecost is a part of this journey. And to answer the challenge, we can turn to something more. I think at this point you know where I'm going, to Psalms. We turn to poetry. We turn to the richness and the beauty of, of poetry. Juan Luis Segundo, a, a Uruguayan theologian, writes in a book about philosophy and poetry. He compares the two and he says, Philosophy is, is that thing that is, is cognitive. We take things apart and think about them, analyze them. That's philosophy. Poetry is what affects us and moves us. And Segundo's leading back to theology and talking about the, the, the magic and wonder and power of poetry in leading us to better understand God in a way that the true, pure Aristotelian philosophy can never do. The British poet Gerard Manley Hopkins writes about God's grandeur. Glory be to God for dappled things, for skies of couple color as a branded cow. Okay, skies of couple color. I don't know if you went outside yesterday or looked up, or if you looked out and said, it's a bit bleak, I don't think I'm going to make it out there. But the gunmetal gray sky had these hues and colors that... that that danced around and reflected something so much richer and more powerful than what we can ever ask or imagine. The beauty of poetry can help us understand God's glory and simultaneously recognize that we cannot fully know God or understand what exactly took place in Pentecost. But we don't just turn to any poetry, we turn to the Psalms. And today, we're in Psalm 104. And in these verses, we can see a record of God's revelation. It's an amazing bit of verses, starting in 24. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom, you have made everything. The earth is full of your creatures. Yonder is the sea, great and wide, creeping things innumerable there, living things both great and small. There go the ships and Leviathan that you formed to sport in it. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give to them, they gather it up. 
I see this hearkening back to the Exodus and the God who provides, the God who leads, the God who is for humanity. And here we see God providing for the creation. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. Who looks on the earth and it trembles? Who touches the mountains and they smoke? I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. The psalmist points to the complexity of life. The web of interweaving relationship. Over there is the sea, great and wide. Innumerable things live in it. Where we stand this morning, 65 East Church Street, we literally can say, over there is the sea. And so many of us who enjoy this place, this beauty around us, this wonderful place where we live, have experienced all of the things that live in there, from the, the pesky stinging nettles to the incredible soft shell crab, which are moving now, finally. We've had to wait all winter. We ran out to the myriad of fish that live there. So when we're trying to make sense of the movement of the Holy Spirit, we can look at the wonder of this world, what Hopkins refers to as the dappled things. He writes about a trout swimming in the stream, and it's as if the poet's lens focuses closer and closer, and suddenly you see the beauty of the pink and hues on the belly of the trout as they're swimming along, the little moles on the side of the trout, the little spots. The world around us sings forth a testimony to God's continuing movement, God's continuing presence. There is beauty all around it, and we can see evidence of God in it. We can look at molecular biology, particle physics, human medicine, nuclear energy. This list goes on and on and on. The world is an incredibly complex place, and it requires specialization. I don't know about you, but if I needed an appendectomy, I would want a medical doctor, not a NASA astrophysicist. They're both specialists. Both have spent many years in school study, and I wouldn't want just any doctor. I would want a doctor who would train to do... I'm pointing at the wrong place, aren't I? Yeah, it's over here. Thank you. You see, I wouldn't want me doing an appendectomy either. <laughs> Trial and error. I think that's something else. We'll take it out anyway. <laughs> and I've been studying theology for years. The world is so specialized. So specialized. Psalm 104 is the recognition that God is the source of all life, daily life, the life we experience and in which we exist in this physical world. God is the source of eternal life in Jesus Christ. We see that echoed in John 14, the, the reading we heard earlier. And we see that repeated again in Acts 2, in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Psalm 104 can speak to us as a Christian family. We call this family the church. And we are dependent on God's renewing spirit flowing forth in us. That's why we come back again and again every year to Pentecost. We're dependent on God who gives us life and who is completely Holy, not H-O-L-Y, but W-H-O-L-L-Y, completely other to us. Nothing comes from our cleverness, from our ingenuity, from our ability, from our worth. We, this congregation, and congregations everywhere, exist to praise the Lord and in recognition of all God has done and created. That's why Pentecost Exists. That's what Pentecost is about. Recognizing who God is and our dependence on the continuing work of the Holy Spirit. It's the recognition that this is God's world. 
And we have the opportunity to live in this world. And with that opportunity comes responsibility to be good stewards, to take care of it, and to live as the people God has called us to be. To be open to the continuing leadership and guidance of the Holy Spirit as we continue to live and to seek to be God's people. So when we celebrate, when we recognize, when we look at this time each year, as Pentecost, and we worship, we can seek to hear the movement, to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, and hear the movement of new life in our world. How wonderful it is to be blessed with a child running as we worship. This is the way it should be, because life isn't this enlightenment, A to B, run. Life is about this flow. And that's what Pentecost is. I mean, the people who are complaining about Peter, they were the ones who wanted to see things follow a certain order. When they were complaining about the disciples and accused them of drinking new wine, they were the ones who missed the point of the Holy Spirit moving in all things. So as a people who worship God, as a people who praise our Lord, let us give thanks for all of those little things, all of those aspects of God as we experience them. Let us be open to the revelation of God and open to the movement of the Holy Spirit.